Dear white friends, country persons, welcome. Pull up a chair. Consider this book an invitation to the table. It's a special table, but don't worry. This isn't one of those uptight, where's your VIP reservation places. Rather, a come-as-you-are joint for my white brothers and sisters and anyone else inclined to join us. The room where this table sits is a safe space, by which I mean a space to learn things you've always wondered about. A place where questions you may have been afraid to ask get answered. For all of you who lack an honest black friend in your life, consider me that friend. My arms are open wide, friends. My heart, too. Before I get into more of what to expect from the book, I want to share a few things about myself. I've been navigating the lines between whiteness and blackness all my life, starting with growing up in Dallas, Texas, as a son of Nigerian immigrants. My home life was steeped in Nigerian culture rather than black American culture. I only got that on Sundays and Wednesdays at church. My surroundings, meanwhile, were disproportionately white. From my upper-class suburban neighborhood to the private school I was fortunate to attend, I became Manny to all the kids who decided my real name was too foreign. I wasn't unaware of racism growing up. My home state, as you know, is the birthplace of Juneteenth, a holiday that celebrates the day enslaved people in Texas discovered they'd been set free, the last group of black people to find out. It's a day that, among other things, calls attention to the state's long Confederate history. There might not have been any lost cause soldiers terrorizing my neighborhood, but from the time I was nine or ten years old, I knew I'd experienced racism. It wasn't that overt, call you the N-word to your face racism. It was more subtle. Like, for example, the uncountable times some kid in elementary school or middle school or high school plopped down at my lunch table and after hearing me recount some playground feat said, you don't even talk like you're black. Or, you don't sound like you're black. Or, you don't even dress like you're black. Or the ever popular, you're like an Oreo, black on the outside, white on the inside. I was offended, but I also thought, maybe they're right. Maybe I'm not black enough. Thank you if you're telling me I sound smart, but then, are you saying black people can't be smart? Let me tell you, Kid Emanuel was working on an identity complex. You should have seen me when I got to the University of Texas and found myself surrounded by more black people than I had ever been. Yo, I realized, these are my people. I'm home at last. You know when Tarzan finally met some humans and was like, oh, I'm a human. It was like that. Those early college years were the first time I understood what it meant to be a black man in America. Part of this meant realizing how my childhood had given me misguided impressions about my own people. I had been fed the same stereotypical stuff about black people as the white kids around me, and I hadn't been immune. They had me under the impression that the only real way to be black was to be Nelly circa 2002, minus the band-aid under the eye. Finally, surrounded by so many different expressions of blackness, I knew I was fine the way I was. But I started to wonder if I, a first-generation American black man, could be taught to believe distorted things in such a short time, how much easier is it for a white person to believe them? Today, I'm grateful for all my experiences, because they were all kind of a lesson. Ask anybody. To be fluent in a language, you have to study abroad. I studied Spanish all four years of high school, but I was never fluent because I never set foot in Spain. Well, my childhood was one big study abroad in white culture, followed by studying abroad in black culture during college and then my years in the NFL, which I spent on teams with 80 to 90% black players, each of whom had his own experience of being a person of color in America. Now, I'm fluent in both cultures, black and white. The book you're listening to is what I want to do with that perspective. We're in the midst of the greatest pandemic in recent times, which has a potential to be the greatest pandemic of all time. Friends, wear your masks and wash your hands. However, the longest lasting pandemic in this country is a virus not of the body, but of the mind, and it's called racism. I'm not sure if we can cure racism completely, but I also believe that as we rush to find a vaccine for COVID-19, we should be pursuing with equal determination a cure for the virus of racism and oppression. The ultimate logic of racism, Martin Luther King Jr. once said, is genocide. I don't mean to be the bad news bears, but we are living in an America that necessitated the Black Lives Matter movement. A country in which the simple declaration that people who look like me are worth saving has become controversial. Enough. 
I want to be a catalyst for change to help cure the systemic injustices that have led to the tragic deaths of too many of my brothers and sisters. Prisons popping up like fast food chains, inequalities in health care and education, the forced facts of who gets to live where, the ingrained ignorance of Americans who can't see beyond skin color. I believe an important part of the cure, maybe the most crucial part of it, is to talk to each other. Let me take a second to break down what I mean. I don't mean chatting about whatever. I mean a two-way dialogue based on trust and respect, full of information exchanged and perspectives shared. The goal here is to build relationships, and ultimately, to help us recognize each other's humanity. I'd bet some Dallas Cowboy season tickets that it's tough, if not impossible, to hold bigoted thoughts about someone whose humanity you recognize. I'd double down. It would take some next-level self-deluding to discriminate against someone you respect enough to listen to.